the Bible says that all spiritual blessings are in Christ. And this morning, we thank Christ for all of our spiritual blessings. We also thank God for the creation that he gave us and all the wonderful things that we have. And in our culture, today we celebrate Mother's Day. Would all mothers raise up one or two hands? All mothers, one or two hands. <clears throat> Amen. And thank you to all the mothers. Our Father, we thank you for all of our blessings. We thank you especially for mothers who have raised their children, who have spent many times and many moments teaching them about Christ and teaching them how to live and teaching them how to be good citizens. We just thank you that families come to you and that you bless each family that comes to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Morning, church. Morning. Morning. Happy Mother's Day again to all the mothers. We're so appreciative of each and every one of them. We're so glad everyone is here today. And we're so delighted to have Brian Mark with us today to bring us the message. Most of you know Brian. Been around here a long time. He preaches over at the Missouri Avenue Church. And uh, we're just glad you're here, Brian, and come and speak your word to us. Everybody has a little different order, rhyme or reason, the way that they do things. Sometimes it's habit, sometimes it just flows better. I will try to stay anchored here in this area as best I can. One of the important things that mothers bring to this world is just kind of an opening is the light that they bring. And how they how they work early on in our lives to teach us right from wrong. I think the the struggles that we see in the world around us comes not from just a failure of, of fathers, but parenthood in general. And so if if we're going to remedy some of the expansion of darkness, there needs to be a greater light source that comes not just from Christians, but the parents specifically mothers and fathers included and it's difficult as we see our parents aging as we as i'm experiencing that firsthand and, and you see how that uh, satan's effect on our body and and our mind begins to have its play and so this morning as we are we are contemplating what we've been given not only by our savior and our creator but also by our parents, we need to recognize that we are constantly as Christians under attack. And it's it's not just happenstance, it's not just luck, as some would say. It is a it is a targeted satanic attack upon our spiritual bodies and physical bodies many times. So to deny this morning, there are forces of darkness at work around us really is to deny the, the core principles of Christianity. Christianity is a, is a force in opposition and much greater than these powers. And so many times we forget that. We, we like to think that everything goes and flows and, and it's just life in general, but really there is a great warfare around us. If you have your New Testament and you want to turn to Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians 6 verse 11 says, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist on the evil day and having done everything, stand firm. There's been a lot of good sermons I've heard in my lifetime about this armor, and that's not why we're here this morning. And, and so uh, access that file in your mind to go back to those sermons that, that they have dealt with, uh, what the armor of God is. I think we understand this uh, in great concept of Christians, that it takes more than just reading the word. It takes more than just believing in, in the in the in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It takes an empowerment that comes through those different aspects of the armor. And so as Christians, we're encouraged by Paul to take this armor and then to use it to resist evil. And that's not just one day in your life, it's every single day. And stand, stand firm. So today as Christians, who do we find? Paul told us that we don't fight against flesh and blood. That means that, that our adversary really isn't the person that we see on the street struggling with drug addiction. It's not the thief that breaks into our business and steals things. It's not the person who, who is killing people in an area, but really it's the power that inhabits, that motivates and directs those people. So who do we fight? What is the power? It's not just physical. It is spiritual. It's therefore supernatural. It's something outside of what the body is able to accomplish and, and how do we fight 
So many times in our society, we find that whenever we fight back, it's the person who's fighting to protect that ends up in court uh, having to defend his or her rights for protection. But how do we fight as Christians today? Satan fights offensively. He is always taking the battle to us. And I think as a week to Christianity, we have got ourselves into a defensive position and posture. And that's where we're comfortable with, and that's where we tend to stay. One of our uh, leading commanders in the Second World War said, one of the greatest mistakes humans make is to build a defense series of defenses to try to protect themselves in related in relationship to the French Maginot Line. That was a great expense. That was a great cost that the, the German troops just walked around. We never know what direction Satan's attack is going to come. My wife said last night she she organizes and coordinates the project graduation at the high school. She she said it seems like the, the problems we had last year and the year before we prepared for, and there's always something different that comes into play. And that's exactly the way Satan works. We can make preparations on what we think is going to be our greatest challenge, and he will catch us unalert and unaware in an area that we never anticipated because Satan continues to fight offensively. He knows your name and he knows where you live. That, that's, uh, that's concerning. And if that doesn't bother you, then I would, I would I'd encourage you to think about that. Do some meditation on that. You know, there's some of the, the, the greatest mass murderers and, and criminal minds in our country's history, track their prey. They will assemble these stalking books of pictures of the individuals. They will they will mark down their routines. And, and if I was to tell you this morning that Ted Bundy had a book and with a chapter dedicated to you, he knows where you go, he knows what you do, he knows where your friends are, he knows what you like to eat, he knows what you like to wear, he knows what you like to watch. If that doesn't bother you, then you need to understand that Satan knows that and more about you. He knows what it takes to trip you up. He knows where you're going to struggle. And he knows the combination of punches it takes to put you in a, in a difficult situation. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Now I would say greetings from the Missouri Avenue brothers and sisters of Christ. We go through the same stuff that you go through every day. It doesn't matter where you're meeting today as a, as a Christian in service of God. We have a common adversary and we deal with the same problems that you have. There's nothing unique over there that we don't see over here or across town, or across this nation. And that can be encouraging. And, and as a church of Christ, we're not so big on testimonials, but I'm going to tell you, sometimes it's the shared experience that we communicate one with another, that we say, this is what I had this week, or this is what I experienced this week. This is how Satan worked on me, or this is how God blessed me. Those shared experiences of brothers and sisters in fellowship is what strengthens us. And Peter knew that. Peter was that sort of a person who was a salt-of-the-earth guy who really made a lot of mistakes in his physical life. It took a, a, a time of metamorphosis before he became the great pillar in the church that he was. So what happens if Satan has his way with you? If he if he is victorious in your life? It, it's Number one, it's not the end. That's not the end all. As long as there's still breath in you, there's still opportunity and space for repentance. But when you lose, there are certain things that we experience as humanity. In Mark chapter 5, verse 2, Jesus is on his mission and his ministry. 
And when he came out of the boat, immediately they met him in, of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. This guy was a local menace. I mean, you had to watch your children in the area where he was, and you never knew where he was going to pop up. And he didn't like to wear clothes, and he didn't do proper hygiene, and his hair looked pretty crazy, and, and he was inhabited with supernatural powers because they couldn't restrain him. They didn't capture him. But they couldn't keep him restrained with handcuffs, if you will, shackles or whatever they had used. And so this is a picture of what happens when demonic forces inhabit a person. They are uncontrollable. They don't have social pressures that come to play. You can't guilt them into putting their clothes on. You can't guilt them into doing their hair. You can't get them to perform a normal lifestyle. They are out there wild and crazy in the society around us. We understand probably as parents more because we have the experience in grandparents and aunts and uncles what our kids are going to go through. And there's lots of times that just doesn't translate well to our kids. We understand that they have to go through some hard knocks. We, we understand that they're going to make mistakes because we made mistakes. We hate to see it. We hate to see them go down a path or a direction that leads them away from God. We don't want to end up where this man was. Rather, we'd rather them experience the blessings that come from serving God and the life that is ordered, and a life that is blessed and productive based on the power, the grace, and the might of Christ. So what does victory in Christ look like? Continue down to the same reading there. In verse 15, they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. I don't know how long this guy had terrified the area, but it had been a considerable while. I mean, he had been a constant scourge on this community. And then he's he just having a conversation. He's clothed. That was a new thing. I mean, this guy hadn't worn clothes. They might not have recognized him with clothes on. Maybe he had his hair back. Maybe, maybe he had washed up and, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it had happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. And they began to plead with him to depart from their region. When Jesus cast out the demonic force that was in this man, he responded and said that he was legion. That means he was many. And that possessed spirit, that possessed spirit, being went into a herd of swine. We used to free range hogs in the Ozarks back early my lifetime, but generations back. And imagine a, a herd of swine that become demon possessed. It's not that hogs were, were notoriously tame on their own when they were on the wild, when they were in the in the woods, when they were fending for themselves. But they ran and jumped. This whole herd went off the cliff and died. Now, inside of that animal was a desire to survive. Each animal in there had a self-preservation uh, that they wanted to maintain life. That, that's true of every creation God has. Only when it's inhabited by a supernatural demonic force is it self-destructive or self-destroying? 
and the swine went off the cliff and died. And the response was, now these people are afraid because they knew where the demonic force was and they were happy with it being in one place in one person. That's a pretty pitiful testimony to that society. And when that spirit was remedied, they couldn't comprehend the, the goodness and the power of God manifested through Jesus Christ. And they said, leap. And so Jesus and his disciples got in the boat and he had been de demon possessed and begged him that he might be with him. And I'm, I'm pretty sure context would indicate that this man was probably Gentile. Because hog farmers were not so much a thing in Judea. All right. They don't see a lot of Jews raising hogs. So this community was probably just outside the national boundaries of Judea. And Jesus went there to give this man mercy. And the man wanted to go with Jesus. He is going to be a disciple of Christ. And he's got things he wants to experience with Jesus. And Jesus did not permit him. He said to him, go home to your friends and tell what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim. A Gentile in a Jewish ministry of Jesus Christ would not have been affected. But a Gentile who had been had been exercised in demonic forces that was working in the Gentile community was, was very effective. And this man could proclaim and, and, if you will, plow the soil and make preparations for the gospel that would come after the day of Pentecost to the whole world. And Jesus sent him out to prepare. And he did so Jesus told the previously possessed, go and tell. Why? Matthew chapter 12 will give you the key to understand why. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through a dry place seeking rest and finds none. And then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept and put in order. And then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there and the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it be with this wicked generation. So why? Why did Jesus say go and tell? Because it's not just enough to be exercised of Satan's influence. It's not just enough to be cleaned and to be empty. What did he tell him to do? He said, go and tell. Fill that empty spot up. Doing Christ's will, getting on with our true mission statement, fills that space that was left empty when Satan left, or de demonic forces left. It puts the spirit back in their lives to be doing the work, the ministry of Christ. Galatians chapter 5 says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in the past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, we are as Christians bombarded with the power of darkness every day. Every single day. It doesn't matter whether it's at work. It doesn't matter whether it's at home, in recreation, if it's in travels. If it's in associations, we are bombarded by this list of items every single day. Turn on the television and what comes out? 
every single thing on this list. My littlest girl is Monroe and she's 11. And, and it has got to the point that it's really difficult to find something good to watch with her. I remember watching things with my children and as I reflect upon my mistakes as a parent, I've, I've watched some things with my kids that probably were not appropriate, put some stuff into their lives that really I shouldn't as a, as a father allow that sort of exposure at those young ages. And so I, I'm always trying to do better and trying to be a, make fewer mistakes so as we were debating over what Monroe's starting to soak up, the kids reach a certain point where they, they start reading and they start understanding and start asking questions and, 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 and they become this little sponge and they just soak everything in. So as parents, you want to put something good in there. There's just not much out there. So back to 1978, Little House on the Prairie. That has been an enjoyable process as we sit down once or twice a week and watch a couple episodes. There's a moral number story and there's way more drama than I remembered. I mean, I guess they had to have some excitement back then too, but it's usually about something that we, we can all relate to. And usually it's a it's a good versus evil. But we don't see a lot of this other stuff in, in, in those programs. I'm not saying it's perfect by it, no means. But it is a shock culturally to come back forward to 2023 and watch what kind of stuff we're seeing today. I'm just going to focus on two things on this list, really just one thing, idolatry and sorcery. You think, oh, Brian, well, no, I don't have any exposure to sorcery. I guarantee you, you do. Idolatry and sorcery is translated from a Greek word, and Stephen here, he can pronounce it a whole lot better than I can. It's pharmakia. It was used in Galatians chapter 5, verse 20, and the main definition of which is the use or the administration of drugs. Now, if you don't think that we are bombarded, and especially our kids are bombarded by drugs, I don't know what bubble you're living in. I've got customers that were super excited whenever whenever you could buy legalized marijuana in the state of Missouri. And they thought that was great. Now, I'm not saying any drug doesn't have its purpose. But when we open our minds to what is translated from the word pharmakia, it's idolatry and sorcery. And when we begin to put things into our life, we're opening up access for Satan to use us and to inhabit us. I wish there were some vets here today. I, Gospel Hill's got a couple of vets to go to church out there. Xylazine. You know what xylazine is? It is a horse tranquilizer or an animal tranquilizer. You get different concentrations, different strengths. Uh, when they're going to do surgery on a little kitty cat, they put some xylanine in her. When they're going to do a surgery on their dog, they put xylanine on it. When they're going to do surgery on your cow or on your horse, they, they, they knock it up with xylanine. Veterinarian uses only. It is today being mixed with heroin, cocaine, meth, and other street drugs. They call it trank. And you go back and look at the videos that are circulating on the, from news sources of what happened. It, it started in Philadelphia. And what sort of person ever thinks about putting an animal tranquilizer in human use and mixing it with heroin, cocaine, and meth? Who would think of something like that? Not me. But it quite literally looks like scenes off of The Walking Dead in Philadelphia. We're talking about people that stand, stand stationary, looking at the sky and twitching. And it's eating their flesh. Their bodies are rotting and decaying. And this is 
spreading nationwide. It's not just your run-of-the-mill drugs that we experienced when we were kids. There are people that are are pursuing our children. And it's their friends. It's their influencers. It's their contacts at school. Sometimes coaches. Sometimes professors in college. You know, you do you do your part as a as a parent and you raise your child in a in a controlled environment, and then you send them for a higher education. And you know, whether it's public or whether it's private, there's evil power and forces in every one of those areas. And their your your kids and my kids are going to make mistakes and and hopefully it's not with mind-bending, body-altering, mind-destroying things like this. But when they do, it opens them up for all kinds of things. So how do we fight today? Ephesians chapter 6 says very simply, Take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, stand. Not run, not hide. A friend of mine's Robin Kreitz, and he always told his kids if there's ever a shooter, despite what school policy may be, or remember back in the 50s and 60s, uh, uh, in case of a nuclear explosion, they duck and cover. What's that going to do? Help you? Not very much. Jesus tells us to stand and fight, or as Robin said, run and evade. Uh, we have a, an obligation as Christians to not just be defensive. We have a helmet. We have a shield. We're, we're gird. We have degrees. But in our hand, we have the sword that is very active, is very offensive. We should use it in our fight. So when the whole world is on fire, whenever there's darkness around us and, and it seems like Satan is winning and, and there are more and more sources of light that are disappearing, there's a whole generation of boomers that are on that backside. And Gen Xers are a smaller group. Millennials are an even smaller group. So just by sheer numbers, we will have less Christians 20 years from now than we have currently because there are just not as many people. So when the whole world is on fire and darkness is, darkness is ever place, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication, and the Spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that the utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Don't remain empty. Don't be cleansed of the impurities of sin or maybe exercised by demonic forces don't forget to fill it don't forget to take it and use it if nothing more than your testimony about what god has done for you you don't you don't have to be able to quote scriptures left and right you can just tell them what god has done for you and that's a positive affirmation so fire is coming and and, and Satan is spreading. And I'm not saying fire. I'm not talking about the light. I'm just saying that that's the way Satan operates. He destroys and consumes. Don't remain that empty vessel. All right. So one of my favorite programs that the kids have watched over the years is The Incredibles. And there's a scene where Frozone sees some emergency 
when the robot is out of control and it's tearing things up and the city's in destruction and, and mayhem and everything's going on that needs to be stopped, just like Satan does. He's, he's on a rampage right now. He's tearing through our society. Maybe he's tearing through our community. He's tearing through our nation. He's tearing through the world. And Frozone goes to his special hidey closet where he keeps his super suit and he opens it and he can't find his super suit. And his line is, honey, where is my super suit? I'm telling you as Christians this morning, we need to know where our super suit is. It needs to be on. You need to sleep in it. You need to work a little. You don't take it off and leave it because it's not cool to wear it. You wear it all the time. And I think if we will recognize that attacks will always come when we're least expecting them in avenues that we least are prepared for, then we know why to leave it on. We can't choose to leave Christianity for a period, okay? So I've been really good this year. I'm going to go on a cruise. I'm going to do some things that I probably shouldn't be doing, but I'm going to leave my... I'm going to leave my cloak of righteousness at home. That super suit is going to be what protects us, what gives us advantage over demonic forces and power. So this morning, it's time to put our super suits on. It's time to remain steadfast. As Paul told the disciples in those early churches, stand, stand. And as Jesus told the man who was demonic possessed, go and tell. When he cleanses you, when he empties you of the demonic forces and the powers that you have been inhabited by for maybe decades, maybe your whole lifetime, you've never experienced the power of Christ. Maybe Christ has never been a, an aspect of your life. We're going to meet people that are hooked on drugs that don't have a concept of what goodness and grace and mercy even are. They never had that. They, they didn't have parents that cared for them. They didn't have parents that loved them. They may not have had grandparents at all that they knew. They've never seen compassion. They've never seen grace. And so when, when we can help as Christians and, and work the power of Christ and, and we can exercise those, fill it with something. Go into this morning. I know we're getting walk with Christ, but I encourage you uh, this song of invitation that you would make a decision to serve Christ, that you would lend yourself to the salvation of others, that you work in His kingdom. Whatever your whatever your skill is, whatever your talent is, God God has given to you to use. Whether it's ministry, whether it's compassion, whether it's earning, whatever it may be, use that talent and gift. God has given you. Won't you come? I'll stand and sing. Amen. Amen. So let us comfort you this our new plan. Let us the way to the tree. So found all the love from the soul of our